Hello, I'm Dorothy Linthicum, and I want to have a conversation with you about how we face death and talk about it with friends and family in different settings and at different times. We won't be covering wills and advanced directives and funeral planning today. Instead, we will explore how death is a part of life, whether we are 3 or 83. There's even a word for this broad topic, thanatology. It is the study of death and dying that is examined with a wide lens and involves many fields of study. It embraces the emotional and physical aspects of death, as well as the individual, societal, and cultural ramifications. That is why the field of thanatology is so important and continues to keep evolving. In 1969, the Swiss-born psychiatrist Elizabeth Kubler-Ross conceptualized five stages in facing terminal illness. Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. What we've discovered is the usefulness of this paradigm in helping us face not only our own mortality during illness, but also other deaths, such as divorce, the loss of a spouse, moving to a new location, experiencing failure, among others. For those of us whose Christian faith is based on the death and resurrection of a man named Jesus, we seem to avoid the topic of death as if it is a final word. A pastor in a small church in Arkansas was surprised when a child asked her about death and dying. The child's grandmother, who was standing nearby, responded quickly, We don't talk about that. But the pastor sat down with the child and asked him why he was thinking about death. And when they explored the topic together, not with declarative statements, but with awe and wonder. Isn't that we, what we all need to do, whether we are 10 years old or bumping 80 or 90? I have a friend in Texas who supplies me with books that land on my stoop with great regularity. Sometimes they're whimsical, sometimes poetic and spiritual, and other times thought-provoking. Not too long ago, she sent me Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. Frankl was a Holocaust survivor who published over 30 books on theoretical and clinical psychology. This book probes his experience in concentration camps. The New York Times described it as an enduring work of survival literature. As Frankl describes his pursuit of meaning, he offers a message of hope through endurance. In the foreword to Frankl's book, Rabbi Harold Kushner, who wrote when bad things happened to good people. He captures the essence of Frankl's search for meaning. Life is not primarily a quest for pleasure, as Freud believed, or a quest for power, as Alfred Adler taught, but a quest for meaning, said Kushner. The greatest task for any person is to find meaning in his or her own life. Frankel saw three possible sources for meaning. In work, doing something significant. In love, caring for another person. And in courage during difficult times. Frankel's most enduring insight was his belief that forces beyond your control can take away everything you possess except one thing, your freedom to choose how you respond to the situation. You cannot control what happens to you in life, but you can always control what you feel and do about what happens to you. Frankel's three sources for meaning in life, work, love, and courage, give us another way to review our lives. In a previous conversation, we explored Robert Butler's theory of life review, in which simultaneously and normally our remembered experiences and conflicts can be surveyed and reintegrated into our lives. In his book called Gratitude, Oliver Sacks captured his thoughts during the last six months of his life. 
And in that process, he mirrored what Butler was doing in his life review. Sachs said that now weak, short of breath, my once firm muscles melted away by cancer, I find my thoughts increasingly not on the supernatural or spiritual, but what is meant by living a good and worthwhile life, achieving a sense of peace within oneself. During the months before he died, the ancient teachings of the Jewish traditions of his parents surfaced in his thoughts, although he had laid them aside when he was a young man. I find my thoughts drifting to the Sabbath, he said, the day of rest, the seventh day of the week, and perhaps the seventh day of one's life as well, when one can feel that one's work is done and one may in good conscience rest. I find Sack's image of the Sabbath comforting, a gift from God that most of us don't have live into during our active lives. But the promise of rest at the end of our journeys is very welcoming, especially if we can feel that one's work is done. What if we embraced the fact that death is a part of life, whether we are three or 30, or 65, or 90. One of my favorite examples of how to talk about death comes from Sesame Street, the children's show on public television. When the actor who played Mr. Hooper, the shopkeeper in Sesame Street, died of a heart attack, the show's creators debated the best way to deal with his disappearance. Should he retire and just move away? Should he go on a long trip? Or should he just die? They decided to use Mr. Hooper's death to teach children about dying, loss, and sadness. It features Big Bird, who has always been depicted as a six-year-old. You can find the clip of the Sesame Street episode in the URL on the slide or by Googling Mr. Hooper's death on YouTube. The scene begins when Big Bird walks in on a group of adults seated together with pictures he drew of each of them, including Mr. Hooper. Big Bird says, I can't wait till he gets back. Where is he? Marie finally answers, We told you Mr. Hooper died. Big Bird was unruffled. Oh, I'll just give it to him when he gets back. He's not coming back, someone answers. Why not? Well, when people die, they don't come back. Ever? No, never. Why not? They can't come back. Well, who's going to take care of the store? Who's going to make my birdseed milkshakes and tell me stories? The new shopkeeper answers, I am going to take care of the store. I will make your milkshakes. We'll tell you stories and make sure you're okay. Well, it won't be the same. You're right. It'll never be the same without him. But you know something? We can all be happy that we got to be with him and to know him and to love him a lot when he was here. And Big Bird... We still have our memories of him. Big Bird, looking thoughtful, said, Well, memories are how I drew this picture. And we can remember him and remember him and remember him as long as we want to. But I don't like it. It makes me sad. He's never coming back? No. I don't understand. Everything was just fine. Why does it have to be this way? Give me a good reason. Finally, someone answered, It has to be this way because, just because. Oh, then looking at the picture of Mr. Hooper he had drawn, Big Bird said, I'm going to miss you, Mr. Hooper. I think 
the response created by the Sesame Street writing team covers most of the emotions and questions we have when someone or something we love dies. The emphasis on memory brought to mind these words by poet Mary Oliver. Of all the reasons for gladness, what could be foremost of this one? That the mind can seize both the instant and the memory. But here's the kingdom we call remembrance with its thousand iron doors through which I pass so easily, switching on the old lights as I go. While death is final and irreversible, as Big Bird discovered, memories ease the finality with grace, gentleness and grace. The grief that follows, however, is very real and may never be final. A year after his wife, Rachel Held Evans, died, her husband Daniel found himself mourning the loss of a tulip tree they had rescued on their property. He writes, What an un insignificant grief I feel for this loss, this tiny drop of a loss compared to the ocean of other losses. How dare I feel this when there are so many bigger things to feel? How dare I give this loss time when others have lost more? It's an odd thing to write about because grief is just an odd thing. It tempts me with the sweet smell of solace. If only I taste it, yet it's bitter and berates me with guilt if I indulge. How dare I? Well, friends, I dare. Absolutely, I dare. That lesser grief changes nothing about other griefs. It steals nothing from others grieving. And to those of us who need it, I hereby give us permission, we may grieve trees. Daniel concluded, I can't imagine a better way to remember Rachel. The greatest gain I found to wring from our collectively drenched grief cloth is to empathize with others who have lost. It's okay to grieve. It's okay to stay still. It's okay to move forward. There is no right or wrong way to talk about or look at death our own or those we love, including pets and trees and anything else whose loss diminishes our lives. It is a topic we shouldn't avoid because like Big Bird, in our memories, we can remember and remember and remember as much as we want to. We don't have to like it and it can make us sad. And we don't have to use big words or surround our feelings with big thoughts. Big Bird asks, why does it have to be this way? And sometimes the only answer is because. Death will always be a part of life. Let's spend a little of this time we've been given through our enforced solitude to think about it.